for a lot of the women, you know, they have questions like, was he lying in bed next to me texting his superior, telling them everything that was going on and things we were talking about and what we were doing? To some of the women, they definitely feel like this was a form of rape, that they were deceived into sleeping with someone and they didn't know their real identity. I couldn't believe this story. Thank you. So the story starts a good four or five decades ago in 1968 when uh, the British government decided they needed more power to police protests. And this is after, you know, the Grosvenor Square protests against the Vietnam War. There's a bit of discontent across society, across America, France, the UK as well. So it's sort of a wider problem in the West. And they decided they needed some elite police to... Uh, counter protests and the way to do that was with undercover police um but our story we sort of pick it up in the 90s which is when there are quite a few women who were left-wing activists who entered into relationships with people who they thought were fellow activists a lot of them were long-term lasting years they lived together and then these men vanished and some of these women were like I'm not just putting up with my boyfriend vanishing. He can't just leave like that. Where has he gone? Who is he? And the more they searched, the more they realized there was no trace of this man. And then bit by bit, group of, groups of different women, all of whom initially just thought they were the only person, discovered more and more about their partners and found out they were actually undercover police officers who were sent to spy on them. The one person or the one body you're supposed to trust is the police. And they were just, it was just the most extraordinary thing, these relationships they were getting into with people. How did you come across the story? Because it's funny, because it, it seems to be, it was a huge splash even at the time when it all came out. And I, I don't know why it passed me by. Why did this pass me by? Did it pass other people by? And how did you come across it? Yeah, so this story, when it first broke, it was in 2010, 2011. So I was still quite young back then at university and not necessarily following every twist and turn as it broke. And it was a great set of reporters at The Guardian that were following it from the beginning. Um, but I came to it a few years ago because I'd done a lot of reporting on the case of Sally Challen, who killed her husband with a hammer and then had a landmark appeal to overturn her murder conviction down to manslaughter on the argument was on grounds that he had been emotionally abusive throughout their relationship and she wasn't in the right mental state at the time and so the lawyer for that case Harriet Wistrich who is amazing she's also represented war John Warboy's victims and so on she represents the women in many of the women in this story and she said to me oh this is another big scandal that people don't really know much about and the women are unhappy with how the inquiry is going and would you like to speak to them? Was that like a sliding doors moment for you? It wasn't a very quick sliding doors moment. <laughs> it was a lot of, um, I had to spend a lot of time working on the trust of the women, um, gaining their trust because when you've been through something like that, it's very hard to trust a stranger. But yeah. with the recommendation from Harriet, um, I then spent quite a lot of time speaking to different women over the phone and then we met in person um, and I did one story for the newspaper and it was kind of a process of meeting them and hearing their stories and it's you know that you want to tell more when you do a thousand word story and you're like I have so much more to say and there are so many more people to speak to and we just haven't done it justice with this one piece. It's interesting what you say about um, having to gain their trust. It's something I've spoken about a lot on this podcast because being a journalist myself and speaking to other journalists um, as well, I always ask this, so I was going to anyway. How should a journalist reconcile these two things going on in their mind? One is I want to tell a really interesting story because it's my career. I'm a journalist. I want to get a cool story out because that's how I progress in my career with the trust. I mean, what I mean is that I find myself in situations where somebody's telling me horrible, horrible things. And I'm feeling for them, of course, because they're people I've become close with and you've, you've gained their trust. And there's a tiny bit at the back of my head going, oh, this is good for the story. Like keep saying horrible things. How do you reconcile those two things? Yeah, that, I do know that sort of guilt complex that exists. Um, and you sort of sit there and think, God, this is so awful, but I must put this in the story. Yeah. Um, 
But I don't think it's that you're sort of profiting on someone's pain in any way. Mm. Always with these stories, I'm thinking, that's so shocking. People need to know about this. Why don't people know about this already? Um, So that's the kind of thought process going through my mind, I think, especially hearing all the different things that happen to the women and you knowing that behind all this is the police, like the people that are meant to be protecting us and, you know, government money, institutions. There have been times when you've had to ask people to do quite difficult things. I remember just ahead of Sally Challen's appeal, I'd done quite a lot of pieces with her son, David, who had campaigned for her release from prison. She'd been in for nine years and he was, you know, he'd grown up in an abusive, in his parents' abusive marriage. Then he'd lost his mum and his dad on the same day. And ahead of the appeal, my editor was like, can you go back to Surrey, to the house where his dad died and interview him there? And I realised that Ooh. That is asking a big thing. Yeah. <laughs> like he has not been back to, he's barely been back to that town. He's not been back to that house. Um, so you're asking quite a big thing of him. But when you have the conversation, he wanted to get that story out there. He understood, you know, that we could have a different conversation and a more honest conversation in that spot outside the house and seeing his reaction to, being back home and and all the memories that brought up, I think meant that we could tell a deeper story given that we had done quite a few interviews before. So I think it is tricky, but you do really need the interviewees to be on board from the start because you are going to delve into so much of their life. And with this podcast as well, each woman we interviewed for about seven or eight hours, they need to really be ready to go through all of that trauma again. Man. It is so complex, isn't it? Because I guess the other thing is is like, I mean, when you're a journalist, you need your copies to be entertaining. You know, it can't all just be worthy. It can't all just be getting the best out of people. It has to be entertaining or no one's going to read it. And then the whole thing won't get out there in the first place. So that's the bind that we find ourselves in sometimes, I guess. I had a documentary one time that hinged the entire documentary for the BBC. And it was it's the only one I've done, you know, so it was such a big deal for me at the time. And about a year later, when it was all about to air it all hinged on I had to go back to Argentina and ask this woman who had been 17 at the time if she minded it going out even though she'd signed the release forms they have like a duty of care and she had been suicidal um, and it, I had to like go back there knowing like oh my god please just say yes please just say it's fine because if she said no the whole thing's cancelled so you do find yourself in, 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 in these kind of situations I suppose and did you develop close friendships with the women would you say or was it all very professional I think um I'm definitely now close with a lot of them. I can could talk to them um, mm. about a lot of things. One of them, the person I speak to most is Alison, who is also a support worker for Police Spies Out mm. of Lives. And she's close friends with my producer, Sarah Peters. So the three of us talk quite a bit. I would say it's still quite professional, but we do talk about the novels that we're writing and the books that we're reading. And, you know, she sat in on every interview and, we talked a lot over the course of the series. So just through lockdown, that she was one of the people I spoke to most in some regards. That's nice. I guess, yeah, they must be even more than anybody else really, uh, is the word distrusting? Is that a word, distrusting? <laughs> they must be more- <laughs> Suspicious. Suspicious, suspecting. They must be more suspicious than than anyone because of what happened. And if that, I mean, what, does, what kind of effect does that have on these women? I mean, you never would suspect a boyfriend or girlfriend or a partner or something like that, you're spending every day with them. Like, that's, that is crazy to me. And then years later, they, they these people were policemen. It's awful. It's awful what happened. Um, are, yeah, are they, do they find it harder to trust? And, and how have they been affected years later? There's different levels of sort of trust and paranoia issues. Um, it's near constant. and But in some ways, it's also, there's a lot of like dark humor around it. So in terms of the paranoia, there's a lot of jokes of like, oh, there's a police car driving past the window. Are they listening? Or we had a few things throughout the cu- creation of the podcast where people's computers died, recordings didn't work, apps broke. And we were, there's always a d- <laughs> joke at the back of everyone's mind of like, they're watching us, they're trying to stop us. At one point, one of the interviewees, Rose's internet was so bad, we had to 
mail her a USB stick to put the recording, the audio onto the USB and post it back to us. And although I think that's just her crap internet in Wales, can I swear? Wales is not a swear word. <laughs> not another crap. <laughs> we like Wales now, you know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, sorry, Wales. Um, although it was, it was her crap internet, you still have jokes, I think, about like um, air locking the recording and stuff like that um but then on a more serious note you know these a lot of these women have not been able to form relationships again um rosa had um her next child through ivf because she just couldn't bring herself to form that close bond with someone again and lisa has never managed to have children because she hasn't been able to trust anyone again and she was with mark kennedy through you know, the years when you would be making those decisions about having a child. I think that is the thing that really hits home. It's shocking. That's the end. That's that's a ruined life, isn't it? That really, how can you go on after that? And so Mark Kennedy was, yeah, he was one of the the undercover agents. Um, and and I guess the horrible thing is they were, they were making these jokes in a much more lighthearted way at the beginning, weren't they, about these, some of their boyfriends. They used to call one of them James Blonde, I think. Um, and it's, <laughs> it's horrible to look back. And obviously when he was being called James Blonde, he'd have been thinking, God, I'm smart. Like you just think, oh, you bastard. You absolute bastard, yeah. you know? <laughs> yeah, I think looking back, some of that stuff just makes your skin crawl, doesn't it? And it must do for them as well. So what happened? Why were they investigating these, these people? Because they seemed harmless, really, like left wing harmless people why were they investigating and and was it that they went off piste to to do for to form relationships or was that part of it well it's really hard to know exactly where the sort of buck stops and who signed off on this and that is one of the questions that the undercover policing inquiry will try and answer over the next few years as long as it goes on for um which started in november just as we launched the series but i think these were they were always these units were always established with the idea of policing left wing activism and dissidents more than right far right activism although there is a bit bit of that that goes on too because they came out of the anti vietnam war protests and the student riots um i think there's definitely a sort of political angle to it like these this was political policing um and so there's an argument that the cops were trying to get to the more aggressive, dangerous elements of these groups. So tr- going on Brixton hunt saboteuring in order to get to Peter and the Animal Liberation Front, for example. But the question is, of at what point should you start using the intrusive tactics? And if you're using the relationships on someone at the hunt saboteurs who you know, is not, is not connected to the Animal Liberation Front. Like, is that really a good way to use your time and money? There is a tradecraft manual. And within that, it does say, avoid relationships. But, and if you're going to have them, have fleeting, disastrous relationships. But there's a sef- definite tone. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> the relationships were certainly disastrous. I think we can all agree with that. Whether they were fleeting when some of them went on for six years, five years, having children, talking about marriage. I wouldn't say that's fleeting. Officers, superiors knew that they were having these relationships. Nobody really knows. But one of their one-time heads of the unit, Bob Lambert, is an officer who had a child with um, a woman when he was undercover. So I think it pretty much is known that this was a tactic in the unit. It's not one bad apple. It was quite systemic. For a lot of the women, you know, they have questions like, was he lying in bed next to me, texting his superior, telling them everything that was going on and things we were talking about and what we were doing? Did they know that or were these men sort of acting on their own accord and then fluffing it a bit with the back office? And that is something that they haven't been given answers on. It's just coming to my head now and, and- Forgive me if it's a stupid question or I don't know. Is this rape when you don't tell someone, you mislead someone into a relationship and then there's a physical aspect of it as well? So that is something that the women have discussed. And there was a legal case where they tried to have an officer charged with rape, which I think, now I'm not going to remember all the different legal cases, but I think that was thrown out or that that hasn't gone through. But to some of the women, they definitely feel like this was a form of rape, that they were um, 
deceived into sleeping with someone and they didn't know their real identity. Um, and there's comparisons made with that case of someone who deceived a woman over their gender, I think it was. Do you remember that case? Yeah, yeah. And whether this is similar. Well, I think the police officers and the police would say, no, the, the women knew who these men were. They chose to be in relationships with them. There are cases where women discovered that these men were police officers and then they stayed with them so it couldn't be rape. But yeah. it's one of those things of if a, if a woman feels like that, then we should also be listening to how she feels about her experience. Well, it's certainly a violation, isn't it? It's an ethical violation. And, uh, you know, that that's where we, I mean, the word rape in, in, in Spanish or French comes from violate. And so it's definitely an aspect of it, but I can understand how it might be difficult to, to nail it down exactly. It's such a complex story. It does feel to me, and I, maybe I'm a bit cynical, it just feels like these guys were just getting off on it. And I, obviously, I don't know them. I can't speak for each individual one, but it felt like they didn't have to be doing that. And one thing you bring up uh, quite a few episodes in, I, I imagine I speak for everyone, a lot of people listening, when it didn't really cross my mind that much, was the wives, the, the initial wives of the policemen, because the police were selected based on whether they had a family. They wanted them to have families already and they were cheating on their wives who didn't know. So every night they were going off and saying, I've got to go and do my work now, but actually they were having a second second life. Did you get a chance to speak to any of the wives or have you heard just heard their stories and how they've reacted? I haven't spoken to any of the wives, although I have tried. But for them, it's even more difficult in a way than it is for the women who were tricked into the relationships because they're quite... They're, they were quite traditional people. They were in police families. They were told by the police that their husbands were going to do really dangerous work. They, you know, they basically talked into this idea of their husband infiltrating terror groups, infiltrating ex extremist groups, and doing work on for the good of the country. And you know, they should put up with their husbands being gone for long periods because it's really important. Um, so then to discover that what your husband was actually doing is going and hanging out with his left-wing girlfriend when he's leaving you. Like you can't even begin to imagine what that must feel like. And I think they've struggled because they haven't necessarily had the camaraderie of the activists who have come together and formed their own new campaigns fighting the police. The wives feel a little bit more, I think, like they're behind the scenes and they do talk to the women, but it's a difficult relationship for them. But no, I would really like to speak to a wife. And I did listen to their testimony in the undercover policing inquiry and find it very moving. But I think that they feel like they've really been let down by the system that was their whole life. How do the undercover policemen, and you go, you go into this a lot in the podcast and a lot more in more depth, but how are they trained and how are they picked out? So a lot of them come up through the ranks of the police, you know, start on the boots on the ground, bobbies on the beat, that sort of role, and then work their way up through the different units becoming more senior. Quite a few of them come from um, lower level undercover work, which is like drugs policing. And we speak to a guy in the podcast, Neil Woods, who has turned whistleblower on drugs undercover work from his experience when he was undercover. Um, but that work is a bit more like pretending to be a drug addict, going and buying drugs um it's a bit more kind of like daily rather than deep infiltration um gathering intelligence so they kind of work their way up through that until you know they sort of get hand-picked for these units and these units are really secretive like in this whole department of the met that they will you will never find any information about counter-terror which has connections with MI5 as well. You mentioned being handpicked and that reminded me of there was one thing that they had to do when they were training to become these undercover cops, uh, which was go and poison some fruit in a supermarket. And they were like, we don't know what the answer to that is. Did you get any closer to knowing what you're supposed to do to proceed to the next round? I'm, no, because Neil never got through. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so I'm not sure what they were meant to do, but I think it's all about using your own initiative um, to get the job done. The sketchy area with it, I think, is he was asking like, am I meant to be 
getting someone to help me do this? Like, should I be getting someone else to pour the paint on the fruit or should I be doing it myself? But then I'm Mm. breaking the law by, you know, committing this kind of, this act of vandalism. But if I'm getting someone else to do it, then that's me being an agent provocateur. And that's the sort of sketchy ethical grounds that it's not entirely clear what the rules are. And I think... You know, some some people say, no, the rules are very clear. Like the College of Policing say, never be an agent provocateur. You should never have these relationships. But then when you look at how the men behaved in the field, they're using a lot of their own initiative. They're coming up with their own personas. They're saying that they're polyamorous and that, you know, part of their personality is to sleep around. They are encouraging people to get involved in more dangerous actions. So whether it's, that's part of the training or whether they've gone off book there. It's hard to know. You uh, talked about some of these guys who were, as you say, they continued the relationship once they were found out um, with the women, with the former activists or the activists, uh, but then were completely different people. They were themselves. And suddenly all the lefty views they had were gone. That almost seems like more of a difficult thing than anything else. The ruse that they kept up for years and years, like every time you're on holiday, that you're spending your day with the the girlfriend's family uh, or whatever, and constantly not showing your real political views. I think that takes a certain kind of person because most of us can't, can't shut up when we feel we've got a political view. I mean, what effect has it had on, on, on them? What do you think of these guys as well? So I think partly they've had to keep they had to keep some of their own persona going into those roles so they a lot of them used their same first name so mark was you know the marks kept their name mark um <laughs> andy called himself andy because it was easier to not you know have someone call your name and just ignore it um so there were some things like that where and they built their legend around things that had actually happened to them so mark kennedy who's one of the most famous undercover cops he said he had been a drug dealer in a past life but actually he had been undercover in the drugs unit so they try to build their character on things that aren't complete fictions so they have some you know rooting in reality but i think it it does take a toll and from speaking to neil you know he has a lot of guilt and a lot of difficulties with the split personality um and Peter Francis as well, who was undercover and blew the whistle on the SDS, talks about those difficulties and not knowing who he is anymore. Um, and, you know, we don't want to be too sympathetic because a lot of these men did some very bad, like harmed a lot of women. But I think there are definite feelings of moral injury and PTSD among them as well and a kind of, you know, dissociation with who they are. Mark Kennedy came out of, be undercover and said those were my true people and I really you know believed in the work they were doing in the end whether that's true we'll never really know um but you know is it just part of the lie again you've got definitely got to be a good actor at least yeah I guess I suppose we we can empathize with with the feelings of how it would feel to keep a secret for such a long time without necessarily sympathizing because they sort of went into it with, of their own volition um, but yeah, keeping secrets for that long. I think I told you I'm writing a book about that, about secrets. Mm, that's so interesting. It's supposed to be like shame is like the big, the big one. Like it, it's rather than guilt. So guilt being something that you can do something about. And you, when you feel guilt, you can sort of push that out of your mind and go, okay, I'm going to rectify the situation. Where shame is like a discrepancy between your idea of, of like, yourself and the self you present to the world you're saying that they a few of them ptsd from from this yeah i think that's quite common um moral moral injury ptsd was which is when you've not necessarily been through a traumatic event but you've done something that's so at odds with who you think of yourself as a person and your idea of self that it gives you and neil woods talks about suffering from sleepless nights and panic attacks and all those sort of symptoms that you associate with PTSD, fear of loud noises. But that's come more from, yeah, his his kind of sense of self being damaged by this work. But I think in terms of the secrets, it's also worth noting that 
it's a bit different to someone who has a second family and is cheating on their wife and that kind of lying because you have a whole system behind you helping you with the lie. You've been given a new passport. You've been given bank cards. You, you're, you've had weeks on in the back room to develop who this new person is and scoured through archives to come up with a name and come up with a legend. So I, want, yeah, I don't know what that means in, for the secret. Um, you've got people supporting the secret. So I don't know, does that lessen the burden or? That's a yeah, interesting question. So again, I'm researching just all this stuff. And, and the thing is, when you're researching this stuff, a lot of it's psychology and sociology and stuff that you're looking at. And a lot of it, you're like, is that definitely right? I don't know about that. But there is this thing where it was long thought that the concealing of a secret is the thing that gives the burden. And in that case, what you're saying is like, they didn't have to work that hard to conceal it because they had so much support. But the latest stuff coming out is that it's not the concealing of the secret or the concealment. It's more the amount that you you end up, they call it mind wandering, the amount that you end up thinking about that secret, not to conceal it, but just about the secret itself while you're trying to do other things. So they would no doubt have thought about it, you know, a hundred times a day, unless they are just psychopaths. I guess some might might be psychopaths, do you think? Yeah, I mean, there's an argument that you could have to have psych- uh, sociopathic tendencies to go yeah. into this form of work. There's been some analysis, I think, when you see interviews of Peter Francis talking about the work he's done and having a very kind of cold face. Um yeah. Neil, I would say, is one of the warmest people I've ever spoken to. And he's so helpful and so kind and very empathetic and would not think that he had any of this. But he left and became a whistleblower because he found the work so hard. So I don't know. It's a bit chicken and egg, isn't it? Are people drawn to this because they have those tendencies and they want to lie and manipulate? Or is it the job that forces you to do that? Yeah, that's really interesting because I'm looking at uh, you know, for, for some parts of this research, like who is impervious to this burden? Like what kinds of people can keep secrets and not care? And obviously, historically, if you look at like literature and stuff uh, without going too highbrow or whatever, but like crime and punishment <laughs> or the telltale heart. Like, Very highbrow. Yeah, exactly. I read that book, um, <laughs> uh, but I couldn't read any other uh, Dostoevsky because it, it's just it was impossible. Too many nicknames. Oh, what all the nicknames in Dostoevsky? <laughs> yeah, that's the thing that's always yeah. got me with Russian literature. <laughs> I know, I know. Because when you've got like, because there was also, uh, okay, so the Colombian writer, Gabriel, Gabriel, Gabriel this is not the, I don't, I, hate, <laughs> I can't talk about anything clever ever because I immediately think everyone's going, oh, look at him, what a wanker. Um, <laughs> but I'm here for it. <laughs> thank God. A Hundred Years <laughs> of Solitude by Gabriel Garcia Marquez. That particular edition I had had a map, like a family tree at the beginning of the book. And yeah, you need that. Best thing ever. The Russian ones don't seem to have that. And they've got all the nicknames. Crime and Punishment was okay, but then I tried Brothers Karamazov. And after like, I was just like, you know what? I've I've got a life and this is not this is not nice. Yeah, I love Dr. Zhivago. That was great. Oh, I haven't um, read that. Oh, I'd recommend that. Although mm. I've read it so long ago, I can't really remember what it's about, but I do remember very much enjoying that. That's a shame because I've actually got a quiz here to test you. No, I don't. <laughs> Dr. Zhivago. No. Um, Please, no. <laughs> yeah, but so, so obviously, yes. Yeah, so, so this burden we all have, you keep a secret, you tell a lie, and there's a, there is the shame, there is this thing going on. And, and that's been obviously a literary thing. Hamlet, that's another one. Um, so yeah, <laughs> who's impervious to it? Who doesn't mind who's impervious? Uh, obviously, psychopaths, sociopaths. And I imagine those who are following orders, which is, is a, you know, an old trope. It's the sort of, you know, the Nazis or the Stasi or whoever it is following orders. And I guess mm. that gave them carte blanche to just do, you know, they were getting orders from above. Do you think that's played a role? Mm. Yeah, definitely. They were sort of being told to go out and do it. So I think... Although you might have people that also had sociopathic tendencies within that, I think they're being told to do it and they're being supported. And I guess in some ways they're not lying to their like superiors, are they? So they think they're doing the good thing. Yeah. Um, you wonder at some point they must look at the people they're spying on and go, is this, am I really damaging these people's lives for the right reason? Is Are they doing enough to mm. for me to warrant being here? Like, you feel that as a journalist, I think sometimes you sort of interviewing people, talking to them and you're like, 
they they don't what this does this story doesn't warrant this kind of intrusion and this kind of angle so you think they must be looking at it and going I'm not sure we should be doing this. But then you've got those tests, don't you? Like in the, um, there was that one where they got people, and I think Darren Brown's done this a few times, where you get people to give an electric shock to somebody in a room. I, yeah, it was Darren Brown I saw, but it's an old test as well. People in a room, and he was, he said like, yep, just keep, just keep turning it up. And every time they get an answer wrong or something like that, and it wasn't really a person in the other room connected to anything, but the, the the one doing it thought there was a person getting electrocuted and kept putting it higher and higher and higher, uh, hearing s- fake screams in the other room. And obviously Darren Brown was finding this quite funny. It was quite funny to watch. <laughs> and But they do, the vast majority of them, it was only one or two out of like 10 who were like, I, no, I'm not doing this anymore because they were hearing mm. the screams and they stopped. The vast majority of people, they see someone in a white coat is saying, no, no, you keep going. And they're doing it. They, they went past the levels that would have killed someone. Um, mm. So I guess I guess we can underestimate, you know, if somebody, the head of the police is telling you to do this. Although, as you say, they didn't say get in a relationship and ruin someone's life in that way. So that does seem sociopathic. Yeah, it, it's not clear who said go into this group. Do, are they saying pick out the most vulnerable person? That's the way to get in there, form a relationship with them. Or are they saying go in, see how it goes, try not to form a relationship, but and then there was an actual genuine attraction. But then what does that mean about their wives back home? Like I don't believe anyone needs to sleep with someone for this kind of work. Like there's no, there's the idea that, you know, they're away from their wife for so long. They need to have a way to like... <laughs> uh, <laughs> let off steam like absolutely no no <laughs> no, no chance um <laughs> but <laughs> were there women uh, agents yeah there were a couple of females and i think one of them also did have a relationship with a man that she was spying on and i might be misremembering this but i think she might have ended up leaving the police in order to be with him that's really interesting because one of the points you make is that they the police sought out people who had families so that they didn't go rogue uh and become left-wing activists which could happen why would you know it happens to people so they had to have something tying them tying them back and there are a few there are a few instances of people of police officers leaving the police and forming relationships and staying with the people they've been spying on. But then there are also ones <clears throat> like Rosa in the podcast. And she very much thinks that her hus- her partner, Jim, got back with her after she discovered who he was as a containment exercise. So not he told her he was undercover, but he didn't believe it. And he, he truly believed in their cause. And she, she was the love of his life. And he talked her back into the relationship and said he wanted to leave the police and he needed her help. And all the time he was still in the unit and he never left the police. And she believes that was, he was sort of told to contain her because she knew too much. What does it mean to con- to contain? Just to make sure she's not telling anyone what he did? Yeah, so she didn't go public with news that these undercovers were infiltrating these groups. Um, he entered back into the relationship with her she was then pregnant and having his child and he sort of isolated her and told her I love you I want to be with you I don't want to be part of this unit but you can't tell anyone it would be dangerous I was the only officer who was undercover in this way there's no one else I wasn't even investigating activism I was investigating a murder that was like before your time and so it was you know lying to this person who knew what what was going on in order to prevent the truth from guessing out. It's such a strange thing because I think most of us can't even imagine, uh, we've all been in relationships that don't work. We've all been on dates we don't want to be on. And we can't imagine spending an hour with that person that we don't want to. <laughs> and yet these people, they must have been in sort of two minds, I suppose. You feel like there must have been some form of real feeling in there, but it's hard to really know. And the women themselves go back and forth so much on, you know, did did he really love me or was it all a lie? And you just can't really know anymore. And I think a lot of them feel like you could drive yourself stir crazy thinking about it. And the best, you know, the the most common way to feel is just, I can't trust anything that they say and I may never know the truth. Um, but on secrets and identity, there's another interesting side of this, which is that for their own protection and because they've had their trust um, violated to such an extent, 
the women now all use pseudonyms and a lot of them don't tell people in their lives what has actually happened to them. Mm. So one woman who's not in the podcast, but who I've spoken to a lot and who wrote a piece for us connected to the podcast, Donna, she waived her anonymity last year and for the first time told parents of her children's friends at the school gates that, you know, actually this is me and that feminist group that I always say that I'm doing talks for, well, it's actually this and I was in one of these relationships. Wow. So the women have actually been forced to keep these secrets as well. That's horrific, isn't it? When you're the victim of something and you don't want everybody to see you as a victim. Some people, you know, you don't want to be that. You want to be a rounded, fully rounded, well-rounded person, not the victim. And then you end up having to keep a secret. And as we've been talking about, secrets themselves bring shame and everything. So she must have, I imagine, felt a bit better for getting it out there. Yeah, I think she was ready then to have it out there. But a lot of them wouldn't want their real names out there. They don't want that to be in the press. They don't want people to be able to Google them and go, oh, why were you spied on like this? You must have been doing something wrong. And then yeah. maybe that would damage the work that they're doing. Some of them are self-employed and that, yeah. you know, people Googling their name, they want them to see their profession and their credentials, not, oh, she had this relationship with this cop and what was she doing that was so wrong that she was being spied on? Did you enjoy making it? Has the reaction been nice? Yeah, I did really enjoy making it. Um, it was, I have to say, it was an amazing project to have through the last year when we've been stuck at home to be able to just focus so deeply on this um, and like be speaking to the women and be feeling like we're getting their story out there in a very truthful way, mm. I think was, you know, almost, it was just a great experience to have that. Um, particularly through lockdown. You know, we had to adapt. We had to do all our interviews over Zoom and have glitches and <laughs> <laughs> microphones not working. But I'm really glad that we managed to pull it together in the way that we did. And I think, yeah, tell those stories from their perspective in depth because news is great, but it's also so fleeting. And you realise when you've made a series like this how kind of little currency a 1200 word piece has you know it's written today published tomorrow over by the next day whereas a series like this lisa said to me i now feel like there is an archive of my story i can if i meet someone new and they say what what's happened to you and i don't want to go through it all again i can say listen to this series and then come back to me with any questions and i don't have to do it again because i've done it for this series and i think that was amazing for us that's beautiful, isn't it? Any journalist listening to, to that will hear that and go like, that's what I want to achieve. What better feeling is there than knowing that you've enabled her to be able to tell her story without having to go into it and having to relive it every time? That's a gift. Yeah, I'm definitely so glad that we've been able to do that. And I think also in because it's a podcast, these women are anonymous. So you can actually tell their stories in full without worrying about not being able to picture them, not be able to have them on camera. And you can layer all their voices and stories together and just realize the patterns that were there and you know the tactics at play and how eerily similar they all are. Because so often it will be a feature on one woman or a news clip with one. And you just, I just think the public don't really understand the kind of strategic nature of it, which you only really get when you hear them all together like that. Does that episode about undercover cops make you as angry as it makes me? Comment down below, let me know your thoughts and hit the like button. Keep watching, I've put a new video with Professor Paul Bloom about why we enjoy watching true crime and cultish material, what it does to our brains and that kind of thing. It's really interesting, just click here.